planet Earth, a miraculous network of diverse, complex, and connected ecosystems, each contributing to the balance of life and always navigating the evolving change to their distinct habitats. Regardless of their evolution, the single link that connects their survival is their dependence on water. Water, the one common denominator in all living things and necessary for all of life. With water making up over 70% of Earth's surface, most is found in our oceans as salt water, remarkably, only 3% is considered fresh. As global populations continue to rise, increased pressure is placed on urban communities. Several arguments surround the impact this has and is having on weather patterns and ultimately our fresh water supplies. Regardless of the debate, the time has never been more critical in understanding the water we use, how we use it, and what we do with what has been wasted. Controlling water pollution dates back to the late 1800s. In 1899, Congress passed the Rivers and Harbors Act, also known as the Refuse Act. The main purpose of this act was to preserve all navigable waters from obstruction. In simpler terms, it would be okay to dump waste into public waterways as long as it didn't stop boats and ships from passing through. It wasn't until the Clean Water Act of 1948 that Congress became serious about fighting pollution and improving the sanitary condition of interstate waters and tributaries. Although it provided grant funding for the construction of sewage treatment plants, it didn't go far enough in stopping industries from contaminating many of the U.S. rivers, lakes, and streams. All of this changed on June 22, 1969, when a fire broke out on the Cuyahoga River near Cleveland, Ohio. This was not the first time a fire burned the surface of the river but it did ignite a coast-to-coast -coast media frenzy. A nationwide movement was born, leading us to the 1972 Clean Water Act, the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency, and a foundation of standards that all wastewater treatment plants would come to operate under. Most of the water flowing from our treatment plants ends up in the vast network of our public waterways, keeping these waterways safe for recreational use while also protecting the aquatic life is always our primary goal. There are more than 16,000 publicly operated plants in the U.S., and they come in all shapes and sizes to suit the areas in which they serve. It's a combination of history and data, plus population growth and the potential for higher quality water standards that explains the engineering and design for each facility. Here's a closer look at what goes in to treating a gallon of water. Welcome to the Wood Ridge Green Valley Treatment Plant, one of three wastewater treatment plants operated by DuPage County Public Works. Nestled near the Green Valley Forest Preserve and along the east branch of the DuPage River in Illinois, the plant was built in the 1980s and has a designed daily flow of around 12 MGD or a million gallons per day. Like all treatment plants, raw sewage is delivered via a sophisticated network of underground pipes known as the collection system. Many communities around the country operate on two separate systems, sanitary and storm. However, there are communities that operate under a combined collection system that accepts both sanitary and storm flows. As the raw sewage makes its way into the plant, it will enter its first step of treatment called fine bar screening. Water travels through a fine screen, capturing all large solid debris. Rakes will then lift those solids into a compactor or rotopress, where they will then be separated and hauled to a landfill. The water is eventually squeezed out and returned to the head of the plant. Once the incoming water has been screened, large pumps will send the raw influent to the next phase of treatment. During this transition, the volume of incoming flow is monitored using a partial flume. Designed by Ralph Parshall in 1922 for the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, it is a fixed hydraulic structure used to measure the flow of surface waters. Sensors track the flow by recording levels for 24 hours. From here, the raw influent enters the grit removal stage. Grit tanks allow smaller solids, such as food particles, sand, and rocks, to settle to the bottom of the tank. A chain and bucket system will then scrape the bottom and lift those grit solids into an auger so they can eventually be hauled to a landfill. 
Once the water has been screened for grit, it is now ready for the next phase. This is the aeration phase of treatment, a very important, complex, and layered phase that works in harmony with several moving parts and utilizes two distinct structures, rectangle aeration tanks and round clarifiers. From grit, the water is evenly distributed between three tanks that undergo constant aeration, provided by large centrifugal blowers. It is here that the biology of bacteria works their magic. This complex ecosystem is home to special forming bacteria that strip away harmful elements like biochemical oxygen demand, or BOD, from the water and use it for food. Another popular but harmful nutrient, ammonia nitrogen, is also partially removed by these bacteria. Let's take a closer look at the science behind what's happening in these tanks. The bacteria feeding off the BOD, nutrients, and oxygen from the centrifugal blowers are constantly multiplying through cell division to form solids. The blowers not only provide oxygen for the bacteria, but they also help keep the solids mixed and suspended in the water. The liquid in these tanks is called mixed liquor, a term used to describe one of the layers of the activated sludge process. As the liquid hydraulically flows out of these tanks, it travels down a channel and is then distributed into secondary clarifiers. Operators strive for the cleanest effluent possible by retaining as many solids as they can. These large round tanks are designed to allow the suspended solids to separate from the treated water and settle to the bottom of the tank. Good settling is critical and one of several indicators of a healthy treatment plan. This time lapse demonstrates the physics happening inside a clarifier. Once the mixed liquor solids have settled, they now become known as return activated sludge, or RAS, another very important layer in the overall process. To maintain a healthy balance, operators collect samples daily. A measured portion of the sample is filtered to capture the overall solids concentration represented in milligrams per liter. Once all the data is collected, operators use mathematical formulas and calculations to determine the percentage of the overall solids they want to remain in the treatment system. This is called the solids retention time, or SRT, meaning the amount of time the solids remain in the system. Measured in actual days, these remaining solids are then pumped back from the bottom of the clarifier tanks and returned to the aeration tanks. When these return solids meet the raw sewage leaving the grit tank, they mix, which is where we get the term mixed liquor. This cycle never ends and constantly repeats itself. The portion of solids that do not get returned are wasted out of the system forever. These solids are called waste activated sludge, or WAS. Much like the human digestive system, these solids are removed from the system and prepped for digestion. At this point in the treatment process, the plant has produced its two products, the secondary effluent and the wasted solids. Each product will follow two very different directions. Let's take a closer look. Waste activated sludge, or WAS for short, is the mass of solids wasted out of the system. Large storage tanks called digesters are used for the digestion process. Space is limited inside the digesters, so the liquid sludge first undergoes a dewatering process to quickly remove as much water as possible. Based on earlier wasting calculations, operators will set the wasting pumps to remove a set volume of solids out of the return activated cycle. A polymer solution is injected into the wasted sludge and then pumped onto a machine called a gravity belt thickener. A chemical reaction caused by the polymer allows the water to separate from the sludge. The water filters through the belt and is returned to the head of the plant while the thickened sludge is gravity fed to a holding tank. From this point, the main objective is to digest the volatile organics remaining in the sludge. This can be done two ways, anaerobically, meaning no air, or aerobically, meaning with air. The DuPage County Woodridge plant uses a unique, unconventional, two-phase anaerobic system that differs greatly from traditional anaerobic digestion systems and requires operating under strict temperature guidelines. The first phase is called the acid phase. The acid phase consists of the hydrolysis and the first acid production step, in which acidogenic bacteria reacting with water convert organic matter into soluble compounds and volatile fatty acids. From here, the sludge is then pumped to the next phase, methane, 
Maintaining a temperature of 130 degrees, the methane phase is a further conversion of organic matter to acetic acid through acetogenesis. It also consists of the methane formation step in which methanogenic bacteria convert soluble matter into primarily methane gas. Methane, a volatile and dirty gas, has historically been used by treatment plants to provide electrical power. However, due to the high cost associated with trying to clean the methane first, DuPage simply regulates the gas inventories using a portion for digester mixing, and the remaining gas is burned off. Sludge samples are taken weekly and tested for volatile organic reduction. Once the sludge is fully digested, it is then pumped to a final holding tank where it awaits the final dewatering process. Much like the gravity bell thickener, the digested sludge is injected with a polymer solution and pumped across a bell press. The only difference is that once dewatered, the sludge is then transferred to a second belt. Using a series of rollers and hydraulic tension, the last remaining water is squeezed out. The sludge is scraped into an auger and hauled by truck trailer out to the farm fields. On the fields, farmers will return the sludge into the soil as fertilizer for future crops. The settling out of the solids in the clarifier tanks produces the secondary effluent. Hydraulics will push that effluent over the clarifier weirs and with the help of gravity will send it to a large underground tank before it is pumped up into the nitrification towers. These two towers, among the few still in operation, are responsible for removing as much of the remaining ammonia nitrogen as possible. The official term for this is nitrification. The pumped effluent is dispersed over many feet of plastic media. As the effluent trickles through, special bacteria called nitrifiers growing on the media will feed off the ammonia nitrogen as a food source. Although expensive to operate from an electrical perspective, these towers are capable of producing results less than one milligram per liter, which is well below EPA permit limits. To ensure the media inside the nitro towers remain wet and fed, a calculated portion of the filtered effluent is recycled back into the nitro towers. The portion not recycled is diverted to the next phase of effluent treatment. Tertiary treatment, the polishing of the effluent. At Woodridge Green Valley, large screw pumps lift the effluent and send it to the sand filter tanks to undergo the removal of very fine suspended particles. As the sand begins to clog from trapping the fine particles, the water elevation in the tank rises. Sensors are used to monitor the tank's levels and when necessary, will trigger the tank to backwash the sand. Once the effluent is filtered through the sand, it makes its way to the final phase of treatment. Depending on the receiving body of water, the EPA may only require treatment plants to disinfect the effluent six months out of the year, typically in the warm summer months when recreational use is more popular. Using chlorine, the effluent serpentines through channels to what is called a contact tank, which allows the chlorine time to thoroughly disinfect the water for harmful pathogens like fecal coliform. Operators test the water regularly for total chlorine residual and use that information to determine adequate disinfection. Only then will a second chemical be added, sodium bisulfite, neutralizing any remaining chlorine to ensure the effluent is safe to return to the public receiving waters. From drain to sewer system, sewer system to treatment plant, treatment plant to our public waterways, and back again. Preserving, conserving, and treating the available fresh water is critical to our survival. In many ways, we've mastered the treatment process returning billions of gallons of safe water back into our natural waterways each year. Though challenges remain, like reducing the energy treatment plants consume, or tackling the heightened water quality standards set forth by our governing agencies, the engineers and operators of today, through hard work, thoughtful design, and innovative technology, are pushing the envelope to ensure all people live a safer and cleaner tomorrow. <laughs>